Building Blocks, Architecture and the Engineering of Rome. Like any early Italic city, Rome was built with local materials to begin with. Clays and the local tufts, volcanic stones. And that eventually led to the creation of Opus Caementicium, or cement, which led into a real building revolution on the part of the Romans. But with the passing of time and expansion and conquest and taking over the quarries and properties and resources of other people throughout the Mediterranean, the Romans were able to achieve something even greater in their city. And ultimately, it became a lavish, exquisite display of marbles and granites from all over their empire. The Romans began by building with what was available to them. That was clay and tuff. With the clay, they could make containers and fire them for pottery and roof tiles. Roof tiles already by the 6th century BC. And for tuff, they found the immediate supplies available to them, Capalaccio and Monteverde tuff. And eventually, they found further and further afield better, more consistent qualities that were more resistant and could allow them to build more monumental structures. So from the original Capalaccio blocks, pretty small and friable, and not allowing them to make the blocks too large, they went over to the Fidenae quarries with big scoriae or inclusions, shifted over then when they took over the city of Vey, an Etruscan town in 396, Grotto Scura. And when you look at the Servian wall circuit, they substantially include in the 4th century BC those particular stone blocks. We date that wall to about 378, so after the conquest of Vey. Then finally they're finding more substantial quarries in the Alban Hills. And in particular we look at the Gabine and the Peperino stones, which are much more compact, can take detail, but also they can extract larger and larger blocks for their building. By the 3rd century BC, around the Bay of Naples and the city of Puteoli, cement is invented. And the Romans can build with this as well because they have the same materials available to them. It's primarily lime and pozzolana sand. So from Puteoli, you have this particular kind of volcanic sand or ash, but it's also available around the city of Rome and really all along the entire peninsula. So what you end up doing is mixing three parts pozzolana sand with one part lime. And then you mix in an aggregate, and usually it's tuff, but it can also be volcanic stone, it can also be bits of travertine. It just depends on the nature of the individual foundation. But this material, if it's for a foundation, is not going to be faced. You're simply going to pour it into framework, formwork, and it's going to harden. And when you excavate, you can see the remains of the imprints from the beams of wood. The same thing goes for the substantial vaulting that the Romans end up developing. You can see the imprints from the beams of wood when you look up at the vaulting if the stucco finish has fallen away. But when you're building a wall in a house, you're building a wall for a monument above ground, they face those concrete constructions with materials. Initially, they're facing them with tuff nodules, cut pieces of tuff that over time get more regularized in shape. So we go from opus incertum to opus reticulatum. And finally, they start to face those walls with the broken roof tiles that are lying around. And this is really taking place around the period of Augustus, although we do have some Republican examples of facing with brick tiles, even as early as the second century BC in Pompeii. But it's pretty much the brick revolution, firing brick versus the earlier tradition of just using sun-dried brick. It's the substantial firing of brick, like a roof tile. When you face the concrete with this, their wall becomes very protected, very substantial, and ultimately allows them to build very massive constructions, also in elevation. We also have the introduction of the material travertine, and that becomes the definitive stone of ancient Rome. When we think of Rome, we look at the Colosseum, we look at those blocks, and of course the pavement continues throughout the construction of Rome, even today in contemporary Rome. Travertine is the stone of Rome. The marble of Rome doesn't come really in the Republican period. The marble of Rome comes with the empire. So you have limited quarries available to the Romans of that stone in the Republican period. So the materials from other parts of the Mediterranean are imported in small amounts, and the monuments that are of marble are small. What are they using instead? They're using tuff. They're using the local materials, timbers, terracotta decorations, and so forth. But when they take over substantial land holdings all throughout the Mediterranean, conquering the people, they also conquer their resources. So we look at the, towards the end of the Republic as more and varied types of marble, white and colored, 
coming into the city in more and more substantial amounts. There were at least four temples dedicated to Hercules in the Forum Boarium, and this one behind me is made of marble. In the distance, there's another temple, roughly contemporary, made of more traditional materials, tuff and travertine stone. So you have here in this emporium, one temple dedicated in the Republican period about the third century BC to Portunus, who is the god of the port. Now, on the other hand, you have next to it a mid second century BC temple, the round temple of Hercules. Both still stand because they became churches in the medieval ages. But what we have is great contrast in building material. It's like with this marble temple, you're parking a Ferrari next to a Chevrolet. And it's only as early as Julius Caesar that the famous Italian quarries, like that of Luna Marble, today known as Carrara Marble, start to trickle into the city. Then you start to have a different appearance of the city. And that tempo and rhythm picks up with Augustus, who's able to take over various quarries throughout the Mediterranean. And so now you can say you see the city in colored marble, unlike any other time period before. It's really ushered in by Augustus, who's controlling those quarries in other parts of the Mediterranean. So we have white marble from Italy itself, but it's duller than a lot of the famous quarries quarried for centuries before by the Greeks. Parian marble, pentelic marble. We also have several kinds of colored marble, in particular serpentino, green porphyry from Sparta. We've got purple porphyry from Egypt. We've got gray and pink granites and alabaster from Egypt. We have yellow stone from Numidia, or modern day Tunisia. We have purple veined white marble from Turkey. We have black and pink and black and green stone from Turkey, Africana. We have green striated marble from Greece, Caristian Cipollino. With the importing of marbles and granites from all over the world, of great varieties and colors, Rome became the most lavishly decorated city in all the world, the capital of the great empire of the Mediterranean. When we look at Greek architecture, we oftentimes talk about the post-lintel system, and the Romans had that as well. When we look at their early temples, we see the columns, but not in marble as the Greek columns, but rather in tuff, stuck it over to look like marble. The Romans ultimately do have a solution to the Greek post and lintel system. And that answer, of course, is the arch. Now, the arch exists in the world in the Middle East already in 1500 BC. And when we look at the earliest examples in Italy, we can go back to the third century BC. But when we ultimately look at the history of Roman architecture and building, we see the arch as a quintessential component of construction. And when we walk through the city today, we see the arch everywhere. The Theater of Marcellus, the Colosseum. Another great creation that we associate with the Romans is the vault. And with the pouring of concrete, they're able to invent all kinds of different vaulting systems and ultimately round it all off to get the dome. And when we think about great Roman achievements, we're looking at the arch constructions and not just open arcades, but also inserting that arch in constructions to hold things together, like the internal walls of the Pantheon or the Mausoleum of Augustus. So the arch is used in many ways. And when they start to extend it and round it off, we're getting barrel vaults, we're getting groin vaults, and ultimately we arrive at the dome. When we think about the dome, the earliest massive construction we have is Augustine in date. And then we move forward to arrive in the second century with the Pantheon. It's absolutely incredible what Rome is able to achieve in all the phases of its civilization. In the beginning, they're building massive constructions like the terrace walls and the temple on the Capitoline Hill dedicated to Jupiter Optimus Maximus. Later, they are going to revolutionize building by the implementation of Opus Caementicium or cement and facing it with tuff nodules and eventually in the imperial period with brick. Again, what are they able to achieve? It's the implementation of the arch in new and radical forms and it's vaulting extensive in various forms. Barrel vault and groin, for example. They get larger and larger as the Romans get more confident in their engineering skills. The same engineering allows them to build very large constructions. It also allows them to haul massive blocks, ultimately in the imperial period, massive granite blocks and marble blocks. Think also of the obelisks that are shipped all the way from Egypt. It's that sort of monumentality that allows them to build a city the likes of which no one had ever seen, a great capital of a magnificent empire.